You're the forgiver of all our diseases. All our sins forgiven. Disease is healed. Peace at our present disposal. Father, we thank you today. As we gather at your feet, Jesus, we need a word. We need instructions from you to navigate us through. You've given us the great commission to go. And you know everyone that needs to be spoken to. And you'll direct us. And we're willing and we say yes to do what you call us to do. And all the praise and glory is to you. You're gathering. You are gathering the children together. Hallelujah. So thankful to be a part of the group. So thankful. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Go ahead and be seated, if you will. Praise God. <clears throat> Today, uh, we are, we call today Palm Sunday. And uh, it's a day, the Sunday leading up to what we have designated as Easter Sunday. And uh, so we celebrate Palm Sunday because that, that's a celebration of the Christian church that represents the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, and um, which leads up to his crucifixion. The crucifixion of Jesus was a mystery, and it still is a mystery to the natural mind. Even to the one, these, those that are born again, it is such a mystery because it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. What what the things that happen? We he goes this God that we serve, and he he shows up on the earth in the form of a man, and then he just he's just God, and, it, and, and because we have been so contaminated with sin, we didn't recognize him. Who is this? And who can be this good and yet be so irritating? Because he, he was very irritating to, to the religious, to religious people of the day. He was, I mean, he, could, he got on their nerve. But yet this guy is doing all this good stuff. It doesn't match. He, is doing, he won't leave a sick person sick. He even goes to the graveyard and dig people out of the ground and put them back on their feet. What's with this? And he loves everybody. I mean, they're unlovable. I might like some people, but he does. He loves them. It makes no sense. And then he says, I'm God. He said, what? It makes no sense at all. And so they just said, kill him, kill him. We get him out, get him out of our hair. Well, that didn't work. <laughs> that didn't work. But, uh, um, but, the, the, the kingdom of God to the human mind is a mystery. It's a mystery. And Jesus is this living mystery before us. And we watched him and all that he did. And so, uh, and we see, we see him go from extreme to extreme. I mean, he's, he's, he is honored as a king to the point where, you know, what, you know in, in our day, we roll out a red carpet. They threw the clothes and branches down, and palm branches down for him to walk on, you know, which is indication that he's royalty, he's a king, you know. And then from he's honored as a king, and now they're killing him. Wow, wow. But, but this, this seemingly senseless, makes no sense thing that's taken place before us has produced something for us that nothing else could produce. Eternal life. Total exoneration from sin. Total forgiveness. And you have to do absolutely nothing. Boy, that don't even make sense. You got to do something. And we try so hard, even though the Father has told us there is nothing you can do yet. We keep trying. 
Even after we get born again, we're still trying to do it. Yeah. But uh, as we grow and we will learn things and, get, and the understanding gets clearer and clearer. And uh, we learn to, what we learn to do is just simply go ahead. And that's what Father really wants us to do. He doesn't require you with your natural mind to just to be able to unravel and understand all that he is doing. But he simply desired that we simply trust him. And that was the very beginning. That was the beginning of the way that God did business when he created Adam in the garden. Was had Adam to just simply trust him through the fellowship that they had. God created man in his own image and after his likeness. And then he established a relationship. There was a relationship and they had fellowship together and everything was perfect. It was perfect. Everything that Adam did was right. There was no such thing as wrong. And so in fact, there was a one thing that he told Adam not to do. He said, I do not want you to find out about this right and wrong thing. That was really it. That was really it. When you really uh, asked the question, so what, what did this man do to get, you know, to get God so riled? Well, it, not, it wasn't so much rowling God. It was what you did to yourself. And, uh, but when you really consider, and I know we, you know, because, with, because now that we have developed this right and wrong mentality that we live by, you know what I mean, we just can't see anything else. We cannot see a single pole. We was born under a dual pole. We had positive and negative when we were born. You know, we were born under that system, that positive and negative system. We, do know, we know nothing about a single pole operation. But that's the way it was in the beginning. It was a single pole operation. And you can look at it from that angle and really give you a real good understanding. You know, everything, there's an there's a opposite of everything. But when you really look at God, when he announced him, when he announced himself, here you, o, here you O Israel, the Lord your God is and they but one wire is one. The Lord is one. And then Jesus comes along and he reiterates that, reemphasizes the fact that it ain't but one. <coughs> I and the Father are one. And then he gathered us up and said, okay, now I'm praying that now all of you all come in and it ain't but one. Amen. So God is reestablishing the single pole. That's what this is all about. And when he reestablished the single pole, there is no right and wrong. Now, don't, don't, don't try to mess with that and don't even, don't even worry about it because your head can't handle it. Your head cannot handle no right and wrong. But, there, but that was the problem. If you, if you don't believe so, just go back and read Genesis. What was the one thing that God told Adam to do? Do not partake of the tree of what? The knowledge of what? Good and it's a dual pole. Do not. I don't want you to know. I don't know. I do not. In fact, we, we have, we have, you know, in our sophisticated tr teaching and training and understanding, we have called them, we have divided and created the dispensation. In fact, we call the first dispensation a what? Dispensation of what? Innocence. See? That's a single pole. You know, a baby is born. There's no right and wrong with it, a baby. They do whatever they want to do and get away with it. Abs that's the truth, because there's no right and wrong. They are on a single, they are born under a single pole. Yeah, there's no everybody gets upset with a baby. You know what I mean? Because they can do whatever they cry, scream, holler, you know, wet the diaper, dirty the diaper, whatever. It's okay. Because there is no right and wrong. You know, and God, we were that way. And you can't imagine that, but we were that way. And God said, I want you to stay that way, but you know, you know what happened. You read the book. And so now, so if you really look at that, and say, so, okay, well, what did we really do? Well, we found out something that we shouldn't have found out. That's what messed us up. And so if Jesus came to fix that, then what, what did he come to do? He come to get rid of the dual pole and reestablish a single pole. Because that's what happened in the beginning, right? Adam went from not knowing right and wrong to knowing right and wrong. So if Jesus is going to come and reverse that and fix what Adam did, he's got to make you forget it. Well, you can't do that with the mind. So they don't need to try. So he said, well, I'm not going to even try. So he said, I'm going to kill you. So you say, you got to get born again. <laughs> you got to get born again under a single pole.
And that's, that's really is the, that's it in a nutshell. So you can go study all that out and get scripture to fit it. But what I want to just talk to you today about, and I just wanted just to look at this wonderful Jesus and, 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 and the, the mystery and the wonders that he is. And, and when, you, when, you, when you finish reading about Jesus, you, could do, you do one or two things. You love him or hate him. You, you want you, there's no there's no in between there's no little bit of Jesus, either all of Jesus or no Jesus, and really when you go to people today and try and witness the gospel to them that's exactly what you get you will get I've had people that get furious at me. I mean just because because you know you just keep pecking away you just you just want them to be saved you just want to love them and love them just keep loving them and love them and I remember this one in particular when I was I was younger. And early when I was out there, I didn't have much wisdom. You know, you get wisdom as you grow older and you learn how to interact with people and you know when to say something, when not to say something. Well, when you, when you first get fired up about Jesus, you don't care about whether you, there is no, no, there is no such time as any, every, all time is ready for you. And you find, about, you find out about that when you get in enough fights with people, you know. But I remember particularly this one day this guy comes to me and he says, don't start, don't start, don't come in. <laughs> he says, oh, don't come in with that today. Don't come in with that, don't come in with that Jesus business. I want to I wanna enjoy my lunch. And I wanna <laughs> but you either love him or you hate him. You know. but, but the mystery of Jesus, and when you look at him and you look at the wonderful life that he lived, and, and you, you know, you, when you love him, when you, when you love Jesus, you're just, I mean, everything, everything nothing, you can't, I'm done. I'm, fi I'm, I'm done. I'm so soul out. And that's the way, you get that way when you fall in love with Jesus. And that's the key to our success. It's, it's not about, you know, I know that we, because of the way that we've been wired with this new system that we shouldn't have never taken on, we just can't get away from right and wrong. And even people that have not embraced Jesus, they still work the system of right and wrong and consider themselves to be okay. And ain't no way a good God going to send me to hell you know, because I'm a nice guy. I take soup to people when they're sick, and I do nice things. And we think, and we think that's the way we think, you know, because, you know, because I'm good. I do good. I don't hurt anybody. Everybody ever said that to you? I don't hurt anybody. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm nice to people. That's not the system we're talking about. That's not, that's not the system we're talking about. That's the system we come up with. And that's the one that we, that's the only system that your mind can manage, can get a handle on. But you can, your mind has no, no, no understanding of grace. Amen. Mind has no, grace makes no sense to the natural mind. But Jesus came and he introduced this grace to us and brought us back to a single pole operation into God's presence. And that's why, that's why he says, that's why loving, you know, the Bible says God is love, you know. He is love. He's not going, he doesn't just, he is love. If you, you, you got to really wrap your mind around it. He, no, he loves me. He is love. Wow. And so if I'm his son, then I have to become the same thing. But that's what this new birth is about. It brings us back into, and if you notice, if you notice the re, a relationship with God has nothing to do with religion. It has nothing to do with that. Amen. Religion is our own system that we come up with to try to get in with God. <laughs> Religion is no good. You know, it's a relationship. You become one with him. And Jesus is this, he is the one that brought this great mystery to us. And, and, and his life, his interaction with us, his life that he lived, you know, is a representation of who he really is. He, he makes no sense. Jesus was so looked like men that you could not tell just by the way he looked that he was the son of God. Right. Wow, how do, you mingle, how do you get mixed in with a bunch of people like that and, and don't look like, I mean, don't, don't, you don't look different. But with the system that we had created and, and our idea of God and, and how we're to interact with him, you got to be something different. You got to be, you got to do something. If you're God's son, you can't do this. You can't be the son of God and, and, do, and you heal on the Sabbath? Oh, no. Oh, no. You can't be the son of God. There's no way you can do that. And then, you, and then you're down there with that bunch, that, that bunch of heathens down there? You eating? 
You down there with them prostitutes? No. Ain't no way. No way. No, you can't be. But yet the same guy that was hanging out down there with the pimps and the prostitutes and the, everybody else, he's healing the sick. Well, where'd you get that power from? It's just strange. And our idea of being in with God has got, has got to be, you got to be good. And you got to do the right thing. And you got to do the, you got to operate the system that we've created. You got to be good. And then we, we drug it on over to the church. When Jesus got here, we still got it. Dear God is messing up a lot of people. <laughs> we still got religion. In fact, I remember, you know, now this is not, there's no, this is, there's nothing against this, but when I, I, I grew up in the country, you got to understand that. I grew up, I grew up in the hills of North Carolina, uh, in the country, and we, we didn't call it getting saved, we call it getting religion. That's what we call it. Well, you know, that's why, you know, well, you got to start where you are. You know, that's what, I, so I got good religion, you know. And, and, and that's, that's, that's not a put down. It just shows where we were. But you see, when you come into the kingdom of God, you don't stay at that place where you come in. It. You grow in the grace and in the knowledge. And the thing that you did then, you, you, you kind of snarled it. You said, did I do that? Yes, you did. And thought it was okay. But growing in the grace and knowledge, that, that it transforms you and changes you. And so well, I want to look at this wonderful, this, I want to look at Jesus and look at what he did and so that it will reinforce your relationship with him and get, get you on the job in doing what we're supposed to do in reference to taking this wonderful relationship that we have with Jesus and getting it to other people. I, I'm, I'm, I believe that once we get all of the people that have, have confessed being a part of the family of God, if I can get everybody mobilized, if I can get everybody that comes in here mobilized, what a powerful force we're going to have going here. You know, and, and when I say mobile, I'm not talking about just, well, I go to church on Sunday. Well, that's really not saying a lot. Because it might be a mice in this building somewhere. I didn't say, well, it might be. But that doesn't mean he's a Christian. I, I say that to help us to understand just being somewhere, going doesn't make you a child of God. I want us to be mobilized to the point where we understand who we really are and, and respect who we are and, and, and to, a, to the point where we are just passionate about conveying the message of the gospel to somebody else that's in darkness. The love of God that resonates in our hearts as a result, as a result of being in the family of God causes us to have compassion for people. And the compassion is that you want people to have what you have. It's like, seeing a, it's like seeing a hungry person. When you're sitting down eating a wonderful meal and you see a hungry child that has no food and he's just staring at you. Who can enjoy a good meal like that? You, you can't even. You could have the best meal in the world, but there's a kid looking at Santa, looking at you, you know, what in his eyes, and he hasn't eaten three days. And you're going to say that you can enjoy a steak looking doing that? Boy, if you can do that, you're pretty good. But actually, this, it's this, the gospel is the, same, is, the same, is the same principle. You can have a person sitting right beside you dressed in the same attire that you are dressed in without Jesus, and it's no different in a child that's standing before you hungry and you got food. It's the same thing. But we have to become aware of that and awake unto that to, so that we can be motivated to take half of that steak and give it to that guy. See? And that's, and that's what the love of Christ will do. For God so loved the world. It's not about whether you are ashamed. It's not, it's not about all that. Your flesh is no good. And that's what I was talking about that all morning. Your flesh don't like Jesus, I'm telling you. And that's one of the great truths to find out. Your flesh don't like Jesus. And it's, going to, it's not even going to mention his name if he can get around it. But then you're supposed to have your flesh crucified. The Bible says I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. So it makes no difference what my flesh think or feel. I pay it no attention. 
I have been crucified. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. In the 21st chapter of Matthew's gospel, we see here Jesus making his triumph, this, this amazing, ununderstood person. Jesus makes his entry into, into Jerusalem. Verse 21, now when they drew near Jerusalem and came to Beth Bethphage at the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go into the village opposite you and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a coat with her. Loose them and bring them to me. And if anyone says anything to you, you shall say the Lord has need of them and immediately he will send them. Isn't that amazing? You go and steal a man's donkey and he likes it. <laughs> what is that? That's amazing. You go and take the donkey. The guy goes, what you doing? He said, I'm taking this donkey. Jesus wanted him. Oh, okay. And it was okay. See, that alone is what will just keep you up half the night. But but you see all it, but this is the mystery of this man Jesus. All this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophet saying, tell the daughters of Zion, behold, your king is coming to you, lowly and sitting on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. So the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them, and they brought the donkey and the colt, laid their clothes on them, and sat him on them. And a very great multitude spread their clothes on the road. Others cut down branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Then the multitude who went before and those who followed cried out saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed be he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. This is the prophet has already prophesied that this is going to happen. This is the fulfillment of that and there Jesus is coming in. Their king is riding in on the donkey. This Jesus is so elevated that he is now riding as a king coming into Jerusalem. And when he had come into, the, come into Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? See, he just, he just, I mean, he, the people just, Who is this guy? Because you got all kinds of people. You got religious, non religious, you got all kinds of people. But ever, he perplexed everybody. Who is this? So the multitude said, This is Jesus the ones that was following him, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. Well, you can't deny that. They may not like it, but you can't deny it. This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth of Galilee. This is Jesus. Well, who is Jesus? Who is this? This mystery. And then he goes on, and in the story, you know, you know how the story goes. Then he is... Eventually, he is arrested, and then he is brought before. He is brought before the tribunal there in Jerusalem, and we know the story that he is tried and such a mystery of the trial. But the prophets had already recorded all of this, and 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 you, when you come in relation, get a relationship with the Father. And then you have to go and get his word because that's what that's the way that the father chose to interact with us. You know, you don't you don't get to go into God's office and, and have a private conversation with him. Uh, he didn't set it up that way. He sent his word into the earth, his word into the earth. And that's how he will interact with you. And he gave the prophets his plan. And the prophets wrote down the plan of God, and it was scattered everywhere. It wasn't just one single word from God that covers everything sequentially. No, it wasn't like that. But it was a piece here and a piece there. And there's a reason for all of that, you know. Uh, one of the things that, that God did was he, if you really think about this, if you think about how God has to interact with his man, if you notice, the devil is on the earth, you know. The devil is God's enemy. He is God's enemy. 
And God has to design a plan to go into the earth and bring us out, rescue us. And you got to, this is the truth. This is cutting right through all of the chase. God devised a plan to come into the earth and, 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 and get information to us on how to get to him. He has to do it in a way where the devil cannot know his plan. Well, there's no language or anything that because the devil, he's above all of that. He's a, he's a spirit too, you know. If he writes it down, the devil can read. And he's pretty smart, you know. Intellectual, he is an, he is an intellectual. And so how are you going to get a message to a people on the earth and then the devil don't know? Well, that's the way he did it. He, 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 he called men, and first of all, it was peace out, a peace here. You ever read the Bible, and all of a sudden you say something, and then all of a sudden the subject totally changes? Yeah. And you say, well, you, you try, you're trying to make it sequential. It ain't sequential. He just jumped and said, one seven men, go and talk about something else. And we call it hard to understand. Yeah, it is hard to understand. Yeah. But here's the thing. The way that God has designed the system is, see, he pin it and what he calls the word he calls it the letter but then he also says unto us the letter will kill you so well, how am I going to know he said I'm going to send an interpreter I'm going to send you a helper when the helper comes he will help you to understand what I'm writing now Old Slewfoot, he don't have access to the heifer. The devil does not have access to the heifer. The heifer is God himself that is in the earth that will reveal to you what the prophets wrote down. Jesus was there with the disciples. And he says, uh, who do men say that I am? And of course, you know, Peter's always the first. And he jumps up, oh, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. He's like, okay. He said, okay, come to the front of the class. However, flesh and blood didn't tell you that. It was my father that revealed to you that I am the Christ, the son of the living God. You can't just know it without me telling you. And so that's how God was able to interact with us without the devil getting in on it. It was so mysterious that, that, that even after the devil killed Jesus and crucified him, uh, uh, the Bible says he would have never done that had he known what he was doing. The prince of this world would never have killed the Lord of glory had he known what he was He didn't know what he was doing. He thought he was getting rid of his problem. Because his intention was to take over God. I don't know. You got to be totally. I don't know. You got to be out of brain twice to even think something like that. But he thought so. I will exalt my throne above the most high. You are a nut. And you know somebody followed him? I've seen the same thing in the churches. I've seen the same thing in the church. People and people follow for <laughs> Some quacks pop up and everybody somebody follow. They do it all the time. I said, you ain't got no sense, no more sense than the devil. No, no. He he rose up and and made such a statement. You know what I mean? He was such an orator, and then somebody went along with that. A bunch of the angels went along with him. Okay, but you want to go with him? Go ahead with him. You know. But my, my point in saying all of that is that the devil does not know God's plan. God is. That's what, that's, the best way to describe him is to say he is. Well, that's what he said. When Moses said, who shall I say sent me? He said, you tell them that I am. Uh, God is, and there ain't nobody else. He made that very clear. The, Isaiah, the prophet, it really recorded that excellently. Is there is no other God. There is none other. I am. It beside me, there is no God. But Satan, in all of his trickeriness, he tried to exert himself 
above God. And that's, dear God, I don't know. He's at a brain just going to waste seed. But anyway, he does not know the plan of God. The devil does not know the plan of God. And, and, and one of the reasons, that's one of the reasons where it, 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 it's so mysterious. The coming of Jesus, the birth from his birth right down to his death, none of it was made, made sense. How in the world is a woman going to get pregnant with a baby and ain't been with no man? Anybody ever heard of that? There's no such thing as that. But it happened. Oh, man, that'll keep you up a while. You know, but that's what happened. Now, now he's here, and he's, he's born, and, and there's, no, there's no man that can, on the earth that can claim to be his biological father. They bring back the old, old adage about uh, which came first, the chicken or the egg. Dear God, we still messing with that. <laughs> but my point is that it's all mysterious. And God did it that way for a purpose. He, it's all done for our good. And so everything about Jesus was, is mysterious. And then now, now that he is born, he looks like everybody else. And he's doing the same thing everybody else is doing. See, I don't know why we didn't smell a rat in that area. Because we think that if you're, if you're the son of God, boy, you do everything different. And you do, you can, oh, you sin, you can't. No, 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 no. They don't think it is all scatterbrained. Jesus did the same thing everybody else did. He did the same thing everybody else did. Well, why don't he have sin? Ah, that's the mere void of sins. He don't even know what sin is. But we think we do. See, isn't it so much you don't know? Do yourself a favor. You can, he can help yourself right now in a lot of areas. Go find somebody that know a lot more than you do and listen to them. Find somebody. Don't, 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 don't pal up with somebody that don't know no more than you. No, really, I'm, I'm being honest with you. I learned this a long time ago. I listened, I listened to people that knew more than I did. I, I, God gave me that understanding. I would listen to people that didn't know more than what I didn't pay. I didn't pay any attention because you don't know more than I do. Job says over there, he says, wisdom is with aged men. Find somebody that know more than you and then hang out with them. I heard that come out of your mouth that this morning, young man. Find somebody that knows more than you and listen to them, you see. Because this knowledge that we're talking about is not knowledge that you will acquire at the university. We're talking about knowledge that's from above. And those with the wisdom of God are the ones that possess that knowledge. Going getting a degree from the university will not give you this knowledge. But when you have been with Jesus and you've been fed from above, then that's the knowledge that you have. But the mystery in all this takes place here, number one, it protects the glory of God, and it provides the goodness of God for you without the devil being able to interfere with it. Amen. And so when you look at this Jesus coming into Jerusalem, he is everybody screaming, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest glory to God, glory to God. This is the Son of God. Wow. Everybody's excited. And a few days later, crucify him, crucify him. That don't match. But that is exactly what happened. Do you see, that? Do you see how unusual and how inconsistent all of this is? Now let's pick up here in uh, let's pick up here in the fifth and second chapter of uh, Isaiah. Isaiah chapter fifty three. This is the same man that they just put on the donkey, spread the clothes and their palm branches, and screaming Hosanna, Hosanna. 
and the highest. And now he's about to lose his life and nobody stands with him. You know, this was, Jesus was so mysterious. There was a time, and you read it through the gospel, you go back and read it for yourself. There was a time when his own family thought that he was a little off. They came to see your family's out there looking for you. Uh, they thought, they thought, they thought he had lost his mind. Isn't that, isn't that, now, come on. I mean, listen, listen, listen. You know, when the neighbors look bad, look down at you, everybody else look, but when your family, and I kind of get, I kind of, I kind of understand this a little bit. It, it's no different. You get the same thing today. Uh, when, when one, you know, particularly, uh, I, I remember some things back in my early, early part of my life because I was, when God got a hold of me, I was very radical. I, I was very radical. I didn't know much, but, but I was radical. I, what I knew, bless God, it was, I told it boldly. Oh, yeah. and, 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 and people thought that my, even my church folks, the where I went to, I'm being honest with you. you know, see, I can say that because you don't know where I was going to church yet. They thought I was a little off. And they just kind of walked around me a little bit. But I didn't, I was wild. I was, I was bold. That's, I, you know, you, sometimes, you know, you just need to tone down. I, I didn't know to tone down. What I knew, I knew what I knew. And I didn't care. I didn't care whether you liked it or not. You know, you know, I mean, I got a little sense later on, but, but it, it was, I know what it's like when people are talking uh, away from you and you know they're talking about you, you know, and I understand there was one place where a lot of people were working at and they were, I, was, I was the talk of the circle. Yeah, yeah. yeah, I knew, I remember that. I remember that, you know what I mean? And, and they said, yeah, yeah, he, he, he's off, you know. But, but I didn't care. But so, so I understand somewhat in what Jesus encountered. He knows who he is, and yet even his family is a little skeptical about him. They thought he's, maybe he's lost his mind. You know, so what are you going to do? You're going to back off? Well, he can't, he can't back off. He has to continue to do what God's called him to do. But my point in saying all this, he is at one level, and then all of a sudden he is at rock bottom. But yet, Jesus has to be consistent throughout the whole ordeal. When he is, when they're screaming Hosanna in the highest, he is have to know, have enough understanding and wisdom to know that this Hosanna today was going to turn to crucify me tomorrow. So I'm not, so he knew how to conduct himself and not allow himself to be so pumped up by that Hosanna that he can't do what he has coming now, what's just coming tomorrow. See, because if he, because after a while, I mean, don't, that's why in, in, in this, you, you, even as, as you, people may, people try to pump you up sometimes. Don't let, don't let people do that to you because you'll begin to believe them. Oh, yeah. When people tell you how wonderful you are and how spiritual you are, you'll stop believing it after a while. And then when the pressure hits, you're going to wonder what happened. Yes. Ain't nothing, ain't nothing happened. You should... <laughs> ain't nothing happened. But you've got to learn, you've got to, one of the things you need to learn, don't let people pump you up. Because sometimes, sometimes there's an arterial motive behind that. Sometimes they may pumping you up trying to get you off their case. Yeah. They want to be friends with you. Tell you how spiritual you are and how much you bless them. I don't pay it. No, I'll pay it. I'll pay it. I'll pay it. Don't take it at all. Yeah, but Jesus would, did not allow that. I mean, he did not allow the Hosanna to become so loud that he couldn't take, crucify him. He knew. He knew. So, you know, so what am I saying? When people start rubbing you on the head and patting you on the back, just take it. No, take it with a grain of salt and go on. Don't, don't, don't feed on that. Because these, because them, this is, oh God, I could tell you some stuff. 
No, no. People will pump you up the day and tomorrow you will. But, but Jesus, the same Jesus that was honored and brought into Jerusalem as a king. Pick up at the 13th verse of the 5th or 2nd chapter of Isaiah. And I'm reading this from the NLT. See, my servant will prosper. He will be highly exalted. But many were amazed when they saw him. His face was so disfigured, he, it, he seemed hardly human. This is the same Jesus that rode on the donkey shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. And they're ready, to, they're ready to put it. I mean, they're ready to put him on. There was one time when they were gonna make. They're gonna take him and make him a king. He had to run from them people. They were gonna take him. They were gonna take him and make him king. They wanted themselves another David. They wanted themselves another. They, they wanted themselves another Solomon. They wanted them somebody they could see and feel. He said, No, no, no. I, bring, I come to bring you something bigger than that. But nobody understood it. Nobody understood that. He come to bring something bigger than that. They wanted a David. I mean, David was the king. He was the man. We, we went to the, see that, that, that rendition last week out at, out at Millennia Theater out in Pennsylvania. If you haven't gone, go see that. It is, some, it is some depiction of the scripture being brought alive on the stage. But, 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 but David was the king. He was the king, and he didn't lose. He took the giants down. He took down the bear. He took down the lion. He did, he did I mean, he would come to war. God trained his hand to war. He knew how to he'd take your head off. He took Goliath, took his head off, drug that big old bloody thing up there and gave it to Saul. Wow. So they wanted them another David. And that's, what, that's where their mind was. But God had something bigger than David. He had something more than what they were calling for. But this was what was required for them to get it. It makes no sense. Why does he have to be like that? Do you see how bad he was when they crucified him? His face was so disfigured, it's, he seemed hardly human. He didn't look like a human. And from his appearance, one would scarcely know he was a man. He did not look, that's how, see, we, this, little, this little Sunday school, you know, you know, ketchup you see on, on somebody's hand. That's not what Jesus went through. There was no ketchup. This man is beaten to a... You know what the human flesh does when you rupture it? It just puffs up and, and it's trying to protect itself. It puffs up and swells and, and blood, dried blood. Can you imagine after his body had been so marred? And, 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 and you probably couldn't even see his eyes. He's probably just face all, he's just disfigured. That's what the scripture said. He was so disfigured, he's, he's, he doesn't look like a man. Can you imagine that? And, and just the idea, nails is ripping through his hands and his feet. That's how, he, that's how he's tied up there. Now, that's not, a little, that's not a little neat ornament nail on a wall. We're talking about a human body nail, not against a board. A wall, nail on a cross. The cross is 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 it's got a single pole, and it's got two arms going out from it. But it's big and strong enough to hold you. And you will nail on one arm to one uh, uh, pinnacle, and the other arm to the other one, and your feet nailed to the to the center, and you just hanging there, hanging. I didn't say sitting there. I said hanging there. What do you think the weight of his body is on? The weight of his body. I mean, it's to think, how do you stay without passing out? But he yelled out this with a loud voice, it's finished. Yeah. You, you follow me? But he, what, what did we see here? We see him enduring all the pain. He is not passed out. He is in, I mean, just the nails alone would put the body into such shock. Just the nails alone through your hands. 
And they didn't do x-rays to say, okay, we got to make sure we put the nail right to it, don't hit a bone. Bam, bam, bam. And he's hanging there. And then, now, 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 now he's already been scored, so th th he was a mess when they even got him there. Yeah. Yeah. If you understand what, 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 what scorching is, when they took you and beat you with that strap, cat of nine tails, what they call it, with leather with metal pieces on it, and every time that thing lashes, it opens up your flesh. And here's a part that we don't teach. Here's a part that I mean, very few preachers preach this. I mean, I never hear it. Every, every once in a while, I hear somebody preach it. See, the, 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 the shame that we don't even preach that. Yeah, they took the man's clothes off him. See, we don't, we don't, you've probably never heard it preach. The shame alone in public. You know how much ridicule that is? Exposing you out there in the shame. The shame. You know they took his clothes off because they, they, they gamble off his clothes. So you can't say, well, they, see, I know, I know how you think. I know exactly how you think. You think like everybody else, the Westerner thing. Well, at least they kept his underwear on. Had to keep on something they didn't even wear. We are talking about Eastern culture in the early Eastern cultures. You follow what I'm saying? You see, your mind, your mind is fast while you head on jeans. No, that's the, way, that's the way you would think because you have a Western mind. But we don't even preach the shame. And then the shame. I mean, come on. Watch this. If you went out here and, and a police officer pulled you over and had you on the side of the road with your hands cuffed behind you and all the church people come out looking at you, you would be so ashamed. <laughs> Just to see you with your hands cuffed. You would be so ashamed you wouldn't know how to come out to church no more. <laughs> and all you have to stand on this, I don't know. You're on, you're on the side with your hands cuffed <laughs> and everybody looking at you. What do you think Jesus felt like? All of these wonderful people that he had ministered to, that he had loved, that he had healed, they looking at him, laying him there, took him no clothes, and hang on that tree. You understand, do you understand that? That's, that's what was hanging there. That's what was hanging there. It makes no sense. And there was no reason for it. There was no legitimate reason for it. Pilate, three times, he would not charge him. Three times. I found no fault. I found no fault. I found no fault. And he is the judge. I didn't say the defense attorney. I said the judge said no charge. And yet he ended up on the tree. What's with that? Go into any court today, go into any court and show me one person in jail when the judge and sat there and three times said no charge, no charge, no charge, and show me one. You can't show me one. Now, if the defense attorney might say no charge, or the, or the district attorney may, may recommend no charge, but what that judge say is what's going to be. You follow what I'm saying? It doesn't make any sense. No, I find no fault in him. I find, three times, I find no fault in him. I find no fault, in him. and yet, they crucify him. I've never known another court, court in the history of mankind to allow that. If you find another one, let me know about it. It makes no sense. until you read further on and you find out that somebody else was in on this. Oh, now that don't make no sense at all. Don't tell me, don't tell me, don't tell oh, no one, and I know we don't want to hear that one. Yeah. But somebody else was in on that. For you and my sake. You got to understand that. There's a mystery here. There is a mystery from the time Jesus left heaven to the time he returned, 
there's such a mystery in that, no human mind can unravel it. It's a mystery. Continuing down into the 53rd chapter, who has believed our message? To whom has the Lord revealed his powerful arm? My servant grew up in the Lord's presence like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground. There was nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance. He, he didn't even look extra. He wasn't nothing extra about him. Wasn't nothing extra for anybody to recognize this is the Son of God. He was despised and rejected, a man of sorrow, acquainted with deepest grief. We turn our backs on him and look the other way. Now, there are people that know this ain't right, but what happened? They look well, look well. I didn't do it. They did their fault. I didn't, it's not my fault. We turn our backs on him and look the other way. He was despised and we did not care. Yet it was our weaknesses he carried. It was our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God. When those Jewish people hung Jesus on that cross, they thought they were doing God a favor. Yeah. Yeah. Hard to believe, but they thought so. They, they were serious. They thought they were doing God a favor. Now, there's a lot more to this, and, and you, just can't, you just have to just keep preaching it. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God, a punishment from his own sins. But he was pierced for our rebellions, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have gone straight away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet, the Lord laid on him the, oh boy, see, I told you there was somebody else in on this. You see that? Now, we, now we, can't, we, can't, we can't handle that. I can't, and you can't either. Not with this. You mean God did that? See, this is, I'm telling you, this, this, this makes no sense. Did God do that? I'm just reading the scripture. I'm just reading it to you. You can, you can do it whatever you want to. Yet the Lord laid on him the sins of us all. It was our sin that was on him. Jesus was a, the sacrifice of God offered on the altar to take away your and my sin. Now, people, this is where it's supposed to hit home. Everything you see on that tree, everything that Jesus looked like, whatever Jesus looked like on that cross, that's where you supposed to be. That's where you and I, that's just where you and I are supposed to be. But we have a God that loves us enough to God, my God, to allow his son to hang there between heaven and earth beyond the form of a man, beaten and shamed and mocked and ridiculed to death until he died. There was no last minute rescue. There was no, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. No, it went unto death, and he hung his head, and he died. You and I were supposed to have been where he was. Now, you hear me good. When you hear this and continue in your ways to do what you want to do, there is only one place left for you. Um, that, that, that's the truth. To reject this, what Jesus went through, to set you free, 
to bring you into the presence of God throughout eternity and forgive you of everything that you ever thought or did. And yet you turn your back and turn your nose up and walk away. There, my friend, is no hope for you. There is no hope. Jesus understood this very clearly. When he was raised from the dead, and he said, go preach this gospel to every creature. If they believe and are baptized, they will be. If they don't, they will be condemned. End of discussion. There is no, there's nothing spoken after that. And this, my friend, is the message that you and I are given to take to this world. God never told you to go tell anybody to quit doing anything. Amen. But he told you to go tell them that Jesus died. Because see, the danger in you going and telling somebody to quit doing something, they may quit doing it and think that they are justified. He never told you. I know he never told me. Maybe he told you. He never told me to go tell anybody to quit doing anything. But to go tell them that he loves them and that he already died for your sins and that if you receive Jesus, you can have eternal life. That's the simple message that we are sent to give. But if you don't have the love of Christ inside of you, you can't do that because you don't even know what to tell. You don't know anything to tell them. This is the gospel message. Jesus Christ has given to us. This is what the church is about. This is what you are about. This is the most important calling. Your job does not override this. Your nothing overrides this. Your first love is Jesus. And your calling is to love people so that they can see this Jesus in you and embrace him because he did that for every living person. It brings alive John 3, 16, for God so loved. How do you love people that much? No, he is love. See, that's how it's done, see. See, God is love. And he says, now you go love people. I love them enough to allow my son. Can you imagine what it did to the father? I mean, you get bent out of shape. Somebody yell at your kid. And rightly so, come on. Because that's your child. But no one just yell at Jesus. You see your son hanging on a tree looking like that. And just point toward the one that did it. You don't have to tell him which one it was. He'll kill them all. You understand? I'm trying to show you, I'm trying to show you the impact of this. But yet God allowed this loving God allowed his son to go. And it, it was such a pressure. It was so much on him. He, he turned away. He said, Jesus was left alone. Yes. My God, my God, why you? I mean, I can see them. Now you look away. Wow. Can you, can you get any lower than that? There is no law. See, that, that's why that, there's no law place. And now, Dad, hey, Dad, he, he wouldn't look. But then it's written, he said, for a moment, just for a moment, I turn away. But with everlasting kindness, everlasting kindness. And now that everlasting kindness is on you and I because you are in Christ and that everlasting kindness that is now poured out on Jesus is on you. 
I just stopped by to tell you who you are. Now, what you do with it is up to you. That everlasting kindness is on you. What reason do you have not to be totally sold out to Jesus? There is no reason. There is no reason. That's what this journey is about. We are the ones that have heard and we believe. And he wants us. You see, it's not enough for us just to go be with the Father now. He wants those that have not yet come into him. He wants them in just as bad as he wanted you in. You need to get a hold of that. See, and, 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 I, and, I, and I hear this, and I understand what people are saying when they get tired and they want Jesus to come. Oh, come, Jesus. Come. Okay, would you be in agreement with that prayer if you had not come in yet? I mean, you, you hear it. Oh, I'll be glad when Jesus comes. They're tired, you know. They beat up. Oh, come, Jesus. Come, Jesus. Would you have liked for somebody to been praying that before you come in the house and left you out there in the cold? With the devil? No. God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He wants those people that you don't like, those people that you hate, those people that's mean to you, he wants them in his family just as bad as he wanted you in. And you have got to get an agreement with Father. To bring them in. Amen. Wow. Amen. See, you, see, you see how this is? So people, do, listen, there is no escape. There is no escape. That's why, you know, I say this is a special, this time, this week, it's a special time because it gives us a time to just stop and reflect and find out what's important, what's not important. Amen. God, it's important. People are important. Right. Yes. Lost people are important. And we're here for them. That's what we're here for. You're not here so you can retire and go fishing. You are here for people that don't know Jesus. That's why you're here. We need to understand that. And we just want to make that real. I just want to make that. I want it to be real in every last one of us. I want that to be real in this whole week. That's what we're focusing on this. I want it to be real inside of us. There's no need to me. I'm not going to go nowhere until everybody's safe in the house. Everybody. They said when the ship is at is wrecked, say the captain is the last one that leaves the ship. He's the last one. He's the last one. He goes down with the ship. If nobody, everybody's out, he's he's there with the ship. He's the last one. He don't run and say, do the best you can. We as children of God are not supposed to want to run to heaven and then leave everybody else out here and do the best you can. No. No, 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 no. No. No, I don't want to run to heaven and say, y'all come on, let's do the best you can. No. I want everybody. Anybody that don't go, and I want to be, you, you just chose not to go. See? You do, don't you see the responsibility that we have? This is, this is the call of the church. And say, you, say you're part of the church, well, then this is what our job is. Amen. Right. Is to see to it that everybody get a fair shake. Now, if they don't receive Jesus, that, that's not, that you don't have to worry about that. You do not worry about that. But our job is to love them. Love them. about this wonderful Jesus that rode into Jerusalem a few days later crucifying but then three days after that he's alive forevermore to live go ahead stand 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 to your feet hallelujah Thank, thank you Lord Jesus oh Jesus you such wonderful savior this wonderful Jesus Father, we thank you today for your goodness. You are just good. Lord, you are just good. 
And you have called us out of darkness into this marvelous light. And Father, it is our desire to share with others the goodness of God and the love of God. I don't know who, who, who in here knows or what you know or what you do or where you are. But I do know this. I want, if there's anyone in this room today that have never made a commitment to Jesus Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to do so today because that's what the church is about. It's about loving people to Jesus. If you're in this room today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ, you've never acknowledged his lordship, you say, well, I go to church. Well, the rats do too, but that don't mean that they're Christians. But if you're in this room today and you've never accepted Jesus Christ and you really want to get the thing settled today without a question, then I invite you to the altar. We can get this thing settled once and for all. And you'll be totally secured in the arms of Jesus Christ. Amen. This wonderful Jesus that hung on the cross so badly marred that he didn't even look like a human. This same Jesus that hung on the cross with nails ripping through his hands and his feet. This same Jesus that rode a donkey into Jerusalem. This same Jesus wants to embrace you I'm not talking about some religion. I'm talking about a real relationship. He wants to embrace you and have a personal encounter with you. If you're in this room right now and you've never had that, I invite you to come to the altar and I'll pray with you. You can, you can have that encounter today. He said, I don't understand. What ain't about you? What do you understand? A lot of stuff you don't understand. Don't worry about it just because you don't understand it. You don't understand how your cell phone works, but you got one. Jesus loves you. And he wants to set you free. Are you here? Just as I am without one plea and that thy blood worship for me and that thy bid me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come again, just as I am with thy and that thy blood worship for me and that thy bid me come to As we depart, we're, going to, we're just going to separate, but then we'll see you tomorrow morning at 6 o'clock, and then at 10 o'clock, and then at 7 tomorrow evening. See how, see what you can do with that. Just see what you want. Don't worry about nobody else. Just see what you can do with that. God bless you. See you tomorrow morning.